So, Excellency is the colleagues, uh, we are now um, formally launching this event on behalf of the co organizers. It is my pleasure to warmly uh, welcome you uh, and thank you for having joined us for the last session of the first edition of the Blue, the Rights and Islamic Talks, taking place in the margins of the Human Rights Council. Sorry for those who are here with us here this morning, but for those who are here, I would like to repeat what this talk are about. Um, the special rapporteur on human rights and the environment reports to the Human Rights Council during its last session on issues related to this mandate. And so the Geneva Rights and Environment Talks uh, aim to harness the opportunity of this moment of the year to reflect on the challenges posed by the rapid decline of nature and biodiversity and the inter intertwined uh, human rights implications. The talks are also an opportunity to discuss how international Geneva contributes to bring together the actors working towards ensuring the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment is uh, upheld the global. Our last talk this afternoon uh, will discuss, will provide an overall landscape of the current situation of uh, environmental human rights uh, defenders, not only from the defenders themselves, but also from the work of uh, the United Nations experts and other environmental leaders. Uh, who have been following and addressing these uh, developments. The event is organized with the Geneva Roadmap 4011. So a few words on the roadmap. Five, six years ago, I think that the Human Rights Council adopted the resolution 4011 on the protection of environmental human rights defenders. In view of the current increase of threats and attacks of people engaged in the protection of the environment, this resolution requires strong implementation follow-up. In 2020, uh, one year after uh, the adoption of the resolution, environmental defenders initiated the Geneva Roadmap 2011, the aim of fully utilizing the opportunity offered by the Human, Human Rights Council sessions to promote exchanges between states, researchers, and human rights and environmental defenders organizations. And we are joined by many today. I was myself supposed to moderate the event to, uh, this afternoon, but uh, as you can hear, my voice, my voice is not at its best. And, uh, so I will hand over to Ijador, the Geneva representative of our justice. Uh, and before I hand over to him, there's something else that I would like to mention, which I keep mentioning um, when we just events uh, discussing these issues. Uh, next week, we will be celebrating the news. So it's the occasion to also remind here the fight of our former and, um, colleague and friend, Nilufa Bayani, who uh, in, in January 2018, uh, with eight of her uh, colleagues, who were all the environmental conservationists working for the Russian Wildlife Heritage Foundation, were imprisoned in Iran and subsequently sentenced to lengthy uh, prison terms. We stand with Nilufa her colleagues, and want to pay tribute to all those uh, around the world who are while addressing the triple planetary crisis of biodiversity loss, climate change, and pollution that uh, this planet is facing. So with that, over to Thank you very much, uh, Diana, and, uh, and thank you also to all of your team who is making this event possible. I always have to remind everybody that without the Geneva Environment Network, it would be impossible to have this type of event on the side of the, uh, the session, the 55th session of the Human Rights Council. I'd like also to thank all of the people who are attending uh, this meeting online and all of those who are also packing in, into this room. And I think it's a very clear sign of the importance of, the, of such, uh, such an issue. Uh, so we will have uh, the pleasure to hear in this uh, event in the coming hour, first a number of testimonies of the situation on the ground. And then we will have also, we will hear also the um, three of the special procedures who are working on such an issue, and I'll be introducing them in a, in a short one. So, and I'd like also to say that as we just talked about the, the Geneva, um, the Geneva roadmap uh, for the 11, um, Professor Peter Larson from the Geneva University, who is part of this, is at this moment still stopped in the queue for the entrance of the Palais des Nations with the security. So you see it's a constant issue. So we'll have a, a word from him at the end, uh, as well as we'll be also hear, uh, hearing uh, Mrs. Tess uh, McEvoy from the International Service 
both of them will be concluding this um, this discussion. So I'll start immediately with the testimonies coming uh, from the defenders who are with us uh, today uh, in the room. And I'd like first to give the floor to Emiliana Recommend Montes, who is here with the uh, PADAC, which is uh, a French acronym, but for the uh, International Youth uh, uh, Resource Center. Um, Emiliana, you're coming from Colombia. You're very much involved in the youth movements, and we are happy to give the floor first to a youth representative for a very specific reason, and not only, of course, because of the importance of the youth movements, but also because youth in uh, defenders are the issue of the report, which has been presented this, uh, this week, which is presented this week uh, by the special rapporteur on uh, human rights defenders. So definitely, this is a very, very important issue, which is being discussed at this moment in the council, and of course, in the field of environment. We all know how much youth movements are key factor in, uh, in moving forward. So, um, Emiliana, thank you for being with us, and the floor is yours. Thank you. I, I would like to extend my gratitude for the invitation. It's truly an honor to be among such team panelists, especially Ana Maria, whose advocacy I deeply admire. I want to especially thank the Collab for inviting me to be part of their network, and thank you all for including young people um, in this uh, important conversation. Youth voices are often excluded and marginalized from these spaces where it is so important to have a transversal and inclusive approach. I want to start by emphasizing the work and the importance of youth-led organizations working for this matter, as well as, as all the young activists and defenders in the Global South fighting to protect our planet and for the creation of a more equal and better world. When I was reflecting on my journey uh, into the climate movement, I initially, I initially didn't see the connection with human rights until I discovered the Escaso Agreement. In 2020, we still needed two more ratifications for the agreement to come into effect. And that's when young people from all over Latin America came together to write an open letter to put pressure on the government, joining the Escaso Aura movement that was already active all over the region. Uh, the tipping point was when we asked for international solidar solidarity and support, and we got nothing from the global north. That's when we founded Latinos for Climate, because we realized the importance of working together as a region uh, to fight against the unfair and disproportionate charge the Global South has. When we are uh, the one contributing the less to the climate crisis and yet suffering the most. Latinas for Climate fights uh, for, climate ju uh, for climate justice, also pushing to have an intersectional approach, because the climate crisis is also a gender, a social, a racial, generational crisis, and I could go on and on. Um, and it's a crisis putting in evidence the inequalities we face in the world, especially in the global world. The climate crisis needs to be seen as a human right, rights crisis, not only because it exacerbates those inequalities, but also because behind every environmental issue, there are defenders risking their lives to combat it and survive. We must urge everyone worldwide to acknowledge this reality, because it is not possible that we only know our environmental defenders in the countries where they are more at risk. It is not possible that we speak more about their deaths than about the work. And it is not possible that here in Geneva, at the university where I'm studying right now, in the classrooms, we barely talk about. It is not possible that when I talk about defenders here, most of the people don't know what I'm talking about. It is not possible that here in Switzerland, in Europe, and in the Global North, People are not aware that their lifestyles, the banks, public and private, the insurance, the multinationals they support, are complicit and often responsible for this extractivism and violence in our territories. It is not possible that when it comes to talk about environmental issues, we don't talk about the violence behind people on the front lines risking their, their lives to defend them. We need a structural change from the narrative that has been driven by the global north and privileged people for years and years, hiding the impacts of their neocolonial and imperialist systems perpetrated by extractivist multinationals responsible for the threats, criminalization, and violence against defenders. We need to change the narrative because even in the climate movements, very often, often plastic matters more than that. People need to connect all environmental issues we imagine when we think about climate change with the lives behind, not only talking about the unique consequences of the climate crisis and how vulnerable, vulnerable people are more affected, about how the climate crisis is a social crisis, but also about the lives behind the protection of the resources and the environment. We must humanize environmental issues by highlighting the lives at stake. Because when it comes to deforestation, there's indigenous peoples and defenders behind and fight it against. 
when it comes to water pollution, there's a, there are defenders fighting for the rights to clean water and for the survival of their community. Of their. When it comes to fossil fuels, there are defenders fighting for the protection of their territory, of their home, and their resources. When I was at COP26, the only way to get the president of Colombia at that time, Ivan Duque, to address the issue, which was in 2021, which was the deadliest year for Colombia uh, to be uh, for the environmental defenders, the only way was by interrupting his speech, asking him to address all the lives that were lost because of their fight for the protection of the environment. It was the only time during the whole COP when he mentioned it. And later on, we got to reunite with the Vice Minister of the Environment, who told us that human rights had nothing to do with the environment. So yes, we must dismantle the, the colonial narrative full of economic interests, putting profit before lives, and recognize that the climate crisis is inseparable from human rights. Because until we do not see the whole picture, and until we do not, do not see that the climate crisis is a human crisis, until we do not see environmental defenders as well as the climate, not only regarding how it affects them directly, but also considering them as a key for the solutions. Until the defenders are fairly represented in the decision-making spaces, we won't get anywhere. This is why we, got, we have to keep fighting as young people. We do not only have to fight for our future, but also for our present. And I have faith in civil society to do so, especially in young people, women and girls from the global south, because I know that the power is in the people. And as my dear friend and activist Mikael Levaria said, the best way to predict future is to think. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emiliana. And, and I'd like to underline that uh, the fact that you're speaking here on behalf of the CODAP, the, the Youth Resource Center, is quite uh, significant because the Youth Resource Center has trained generations of young human rights activists. And right now you're coming as a climate activist. There's even no difference between climate activists, environmental activists, and human rights activists when we're talking about the youth movement. And I think it's something which we, we have to, to give a lot of attention to because it, it definitely sends a message. Let me turn now to Ana Maria Rodriguez Valencia. Ana Maria, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, you're from the very well-known uh, Colombian Commission of Jurists, uh, a highly respected organization. And you have quite a lot to say about the situation of environmental defenders on the basis of your own experience. Once again, thank you for being with us. The floor is yours. Thank you, Yves, and thank you to all those who organized uh, the event today for the opportunity to also share with Emiliana uh, the Colombian situation with, with you, what is happening to environmental defenders. Um, there's a lot to say and very few time. Uh, so I will try to be brief and, and concrete. Um, last year, the Colombian Commission of the Jurist registered 175 human rights defenders killed in our country. The number is lower by 13% to the number of uh, 2022. So it's an improvement. But still, it's a very critical and alarming uh, figure that should keep us uh, worried. Last week, the Inter-American Commission uh, for Human Rights uh, insisted that Colombia is the part of the region where most of the defenders are killed and where most of the environmental defenders, Afro-descendant Afro, Afro and indigenous leaders uh, in the continent, in the region and in the continent, are killed. So it's something that is not new. Um, Global Witness also mentioned that Colombia has the highest number of environmental defenders killing, uh, killed in around the world with 60 uh, killed in 2022. So uh, there's no, no, no secret we face uh, one of the most difficult situations uh, in the region and in the world with regard to defending those who defend the environment. Um, Although we have had a change of government and we have a strong commitment with what human rights and environmental defenders do on their side, nevertheless, our constitutional court uh, um, issued a ruling by December last year uh, of what is called an estado de cosas inconstitucional in Spanish, um, an unconstitutional state of affairs uh, in, in English, uh, which means uh, that the court found, starting from concrete individual cases, um, that the context of vulnerability and of violation, repeated violation of rights 
for those who defend human rights or the environment is so widespread that they can consider that the violation of rights is structural. And that entitles the court to uh, give structural orders to the institutions to try to stop the levels of violence. So uh, the court considered on December 6th that the violation to the rights to personal security, um, judicial guarantees, the right to defend uh, rights, even the right to access to justice uh, was so widely violated, were so widely violated uh, because of the lack of uh, action of the national institutions, particularly those responsible for the protection of the life and integrity of uh, leaders and defenders. Um, and because of the lack of results in the investigation of the crimes against defenders, that uh, this unconstitutional state of affairs should be declared. So uh, with this, this ruling, which is really important for Colombian defenders and for environmental defenders, of course, um, the court gives uh, three types of different uh, orders, three types of different measures. So on one hand, short-term measures, are for those 20 concrete cases that were the ones starting the, the unconstitutional, the challenge, uh, the constitutional challenge that uh, was the cause of the ruling, so to say. It was a group of uh, organizations that presented these cases to the court. Um, and those 20 cases should be immediately addressed in less than three months in terms of giving them concrete protection measures also, but also concrete results in terms of the investigation. So that's like short-term measure. Then on uh, mid-term and long-term measures, the court ordered the Colombian government to issue an integral protection uh, plan, a long-term uh, plan that uh, includes um, protection measures, uh, I mean, like a protection plan individually and collectively for, for those uh, defending the environment or uh, human rights. Uh, concrete advances in terms of investigation, both on the criminal, but also on the disciplinary level. Third, um, concrete measures in terms of dismantling armed actors and criminal uh, groups attacking those who defend the environment. Uh, fourth, uh, the reactivation and the proper functioning of those scenarios for dialogue between civil society and the government with regard to the protection of defenders. And uh, finally, a concrete uh, communication system that allows uh, communities, defenders, and NGOs to uh, present concrete urgent cases when the urgency is, is actually taking place. So this is a, a very good uh, news for, for us in Colombia. Uh, from many uh, perspectives, is a way of implementing uh, the recommendations that Michel, as, as a reporter on, on human rights defenders, made when he visited Colombia in 2018. Uh, and we hope that uh, together with the ratification of the Escazú Agreement, which is all already mm -hmm. halfway in Colombia, it has been approved as a law, but we are still waiting for the revision of the Constitutional Court. Uh, would give uh, concrete uh, tools for environment defenders in Colombia to actually try to tackle violence. Thank you so much, um, Ana Maria, for sharing this with us. And, and congratulations for the outcome of your work, because this is quite uh, remarkable for the situation in, in Colombia, but it's also quite remarkable for all of us and gives a lot of food for thoughts, not only for the region, but also for the other regions. And actually, I will turn now to a, another region, which is Asia. I think we have to be careful with the figures we have. Uh, I, I suspect that the very high figures we have from the Latin American region is also due to the fact that people report and that there are places to get this information. Unfortunately, it's not always the case in many other places throughout the world. And so the figures are lower, but it doesn't mean that the reality is not as dim as unfortunately it can be. So. Uh, Lia Mia uh, Torres, um, you're coming from the Philippines. Um, Lia, you are part of the uh, Center for Environmental Concerns. You work in the field of uh, environmental defenders, you're very well known. We'd like to hear what is your view of the situation in Asia. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. And thank you also for organizing this event. So I'm actually here um, 
when we went here, we actually wanted to be with two women activists, uh, Jed Taman and Janila Castro. But unfortunately, they cannot join us because um, another case was filed against them. But I'm just here to, I would like to take some of your time to share their story, just to give a uh, concrete example of what we environmental defenders in Asia are facing. So Jed and Janila uh, are 21 and 22 years old when they were abducted. During that time, they were working on uh, researching the impacts of land reclamation projects or the dumping or filling of materials to extend coastlines and the consequent dredging that is needed to get these filling materials. So while they were conducting research, particularly on a project that is partnered with a, um, a project by uh, San Miguel Corporation from the Philippines and Buscalis from the Netherlands, uh, they were surveilled while they were going around the, talking to fisher folk. And after weeks of surveillance, uh, they were abducted in September 2 last year. So they found out, uh, their colleagues found out about it because somebody posted on social media that somebody was uh, abducted. And they went to, when, when they went to the house, they only found their slippers um, in that house. And when they interviewed people, they said that indeed two women were taken in a van. So after that, there were 17 days of silence. Then finally, we, we found out that there is going to be a press conference that was going to be held by the military because they're saying two women are going to surrender as communist rebels. So as apparently that was Jed and Janila um, because while they were uh, held for 17 days in two safe houses, they were interrogated, they were tortured to admit that they were communist rebels. So they had no choice because they feared for their life. Um, but uh, among themselves, they said that we will agree that we will say what they want um, now. But in actuality, what happened was they said in the press conference, along with the military in the panel, that uh, they were abducted. So during that time, they were really thinking that they will be killed after um, telling the truth. But because um, civil society organizations, their schoolmates, their colleagues, all of us went to uh, to the building with where they were during the press conference, we were able to assert their release. So um, after that uh, press conference right away, they were turned over to the Commission on Human Rights. That's just, uh, they're just two um, uh, success stories of all the cases in the Philippines because most of the time they do not get surfaced at all. But because of the quick thinking and bravery of these women, they were able to get through this ordeal. But after that, um, so we got them out. They were filed the case of perjury, um, but that got dismissed. And right when we were coming here, they didn't even know that there was already a warrant of arrest out for grave oral defamation. It was the military that filed the case against them because they're um, saying that uh, they're not, they said that um, while they were in, uh, in captivity, they said that um, they made a different kind of statement in their uh, affidavit. But of course, the two women are saying that we had no choice. We were under duress. So um, that's what happened to Jed and Janila. Uh, they are still in sanctuary now. They can't go back at home because um, their families are being surveilled. Their communities are being surveilled. They cannot continue with their advocacy of environmental protection. Imagine they were just 21 and 22 years old. So. Um, the, their situation reflects um, many uh, other cases happening all over Asia, but Asia and the Pacific, where the attacks are related to projects that are being pushed by governments and corporations. Even if there's a uh, guiding principles in business and human rights, um, not all countries and corporations follow these um, policies. And then uh, it is also a trend that military is being used against them. And it is also usually under the justification of counterinsurgency, peace and security, counterterrorism. So they're using anti-terror laws and other um, such policies just to justify the attacks and defenders. And um, other laws are being used as well, like uh, common uh, crimes, robbery. Um, some are arson, possession of firearms. So everything are used against defenders. Um, just to stop uh, their advocacy. And uh, in the Philippines, for example, we, we have laws to protect the environment, but not all of the time they are being implemented. 
there are laws to protect human rights, um, but then again, not on human rights defenders. So the, when we seek the international level for remedies, we have no regional mechanism um, in Asia. Um, there's an ongoing process of the ASEAN regional framework, but um, it doesn't look very uh, promising at the moment. But um, that's the things that we lack in the region. And what we're really seeing is that the most effective thing that can address these issues are people's movements, civil society organizations, solidarity from other um, organizations in other countries. And that's why we are also here engaging in uh, the Human Rights Council sessions in Geneva to tell the truth of what's happening, to, um, to gather support, because um, we know that our governments are saying different things compared to what civil society are saying. So um, um, maybe just to end, I, um, thank you again for um, bringing these great organizations together and people who are doing important work on environment and human rights. And I hope that um, we will have something concrete out of um, uh, the networks and the partnerships that we get. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lia, for bringing us the, the stories. We had hoped to have one of your two colleagues here at this place, and we're quite uh, sad that they were unable to make the trip here to the Human Rights Council, where we're talking precisely of cases that were, that were concerning them very, very directly. So now let me turn to uh, Joseph Burke. Joseph, you work in, uh, in Nairobi, in, in, in Kenya. Uh, fortunately for you, you're not in the category of uh, targeted environmental defenders. Uh, and actually, you're working with UNEP, and through their other representative are also here. We'd like to say hello. Um, and uh, UNEP and your organization are preparing a number of guidelines and toolkits for environmental defenders. Could you present this work? Sure, exactly. Thanks, Yves, and thanks everyone for being here and to the organizers of the event. So, as you've just heard from Emiliana, Ana Maria, and Leah, even though EHRDs are leading the reforms necessary to protect the people and this planet by speaking up uh, against activities that harm the environment. They're often opposing a powerful interest in putting themselves, their families, and communities at risk. In spite of this, however, there are some positive developments as various stakeholders have established initiatives to recognize the work and contributions of EHRDs, as well as secure their safety and support. In line with this, I'd like to talk about an upcoming report by UNEP and the Universal Rights Group called Protecting the Frontline, Good Practices for Supporting Environmental Human Rights Defenders, which illustrates some of these initiatives implemented around the world from which we can all learn to do more to protect and support environmental defenders. And the report will show that generally recognition and support strategies tend to focus on three lines. The first of which is to increase respect and acknowledgement of the essential role of EHRDs and prevent risks to their enjoyment of human rights. As will be shown in the report, creating conditions which prevent risk to EHRDs before they come into being includes creating and strengthening human rights norms and policies and related legislation, regulation, and guidelines to maintain an open civic space for the protection of the environment. Examples of good practices include the legal recognition of the legitimacy and value of EHRDs work, express recognition of human rights and their interrelationship with the environment, regulation of business enterprises, activities, and responsibilities, as well as facilitating access to information and public participation processes. The second line relates to addressing and responding to situations that impact EHRD's human rights in order to mitigate their impact and prevent their escalation. Since the work of EHRDs tends to conflict with powerful interests, in all countries, regardless of how open the civic spaces are, and how robust uh, the rule of law system is, EHRDs face risks and obstacles that threaten the enjoyment of their rights, well-being, and work. In response to these attacks, EHRDs and supporting actors have put in place emergency or rapid response strategies, which include 24-7 services through which EHRDs can access information, legal advice, and financial support. Good practices to support these situations also include building resilience and reducing EHRD's vulnerabilities so that defenders are able to prevent the escalation of threats, develop their work uh, despite the power imbalance that most face. And third, 
Supporting EHRD's access to justice systems and effective remedies has been identified as a key strategy to address the underlying causes of violence and other forms of aggression against EHRDs, and to thus secure the realization of their human rights and their ability to do their work, as well as to increase accountability uh, for those who harm the environment and violate the rights of defenders. While justice systems may be inaccessible to EHRDs for a variety of reasons, support practices can help remove these barriers by creating enabling frameworks that allow citizens to demand the observance of environmental laws and standards, including corporate accountability legislation, and by raising awareness of the discriminatory operation of justice systems. Finally, an important practice to support EHRDs in their work is allowing them to access effective remedies that are tailored to and consistent with their specific social and environmental context and identities. Now, while I've provided a brief overview of the forthcoming report, it'll detail diverse support practices that have worked to support EHRDs, and it also summarizes the key learnings that emerge from them with the objective of inspiring individuals and organizations worldwide to take action to support EHRDs. In doing so, this report aims to strengthen and foster the replication and permanence of such support strategies and has the overall, overall objective uh, to contribute to maintaining an open civic space for environmental protection across the world and to promote a positive narrative of EHRDs and to recognize their contributions to addressing the interlinked environmental crises afflicting uh, our planet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is, the, um, is this document already uh, available on the website? It's still, so it's still not available. Uh, we're, we're finalizing the details and finishing touches on it, but it will be available soon. Okay, great. Well, keep us informed so that everybody can have access to it. Thank you very much. And, and I think it's a good example of the work which is done on, on the side of, uh, for example, UNEP and, and a number of organizations. But let me turn now to also what is done here in the human rights system here in, uh, in Geneva. And of course, uh, I'll first turn to Professor David Boyd, the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment. Now, David, you have worked and you have been very vocal about the protection of environmental defenders. You've worked more than once with Mary Taylor, the Special Rapporteur on uh, Human Rights Defenders, and both things are very much linked. The floor is yours. Thanks very much, Eve. Uh, just Mary Lawler, yes. Um, and I'd also just like to say uh, it's a real privilege to be on a panel with Emiliana, Anna Maria, and Leah. Um, as a special rapporteur, I have to admit that I draw an incredible amount of inspiration from the courage that people like you do, the, the courage that you demonstrate in your work. I mean, I think it's truly extraordinary uh, meeting with Leah and some of her colleagues from the Philippines the other day. I mean, just the horrific things that you hear about intimidation, murders, criminalization, red tagging. And not a week goes by that I don't hear from environmental human rights defenders in different countries in the world. You know, people I knew from a past career that are in jail in Vietnam on trumped up tax evasion charges, completely bogus. Uh, women human rights defenders in El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, Nicaragua that are really literally putting their lives on the line every day in the work that they do. Um, young, young women that I met from Liberia and Cote d'Ivoire in West Africa who are fighting these transnational corporations that are just running amok on our planet. And, you know, my latest report to the Human Rights Council here is about those large transnational businesses and the way that they are systematically abusing human rights and in particular the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. So I don't think there's more important work that we as rapporteurs do than doing everything we humanly can to support the people like you who are on the front line. So just wanted to start by saying thank you. Um, and the other thing to say in terms of the work that we do here at the Council, we have the UN Declaration on Human Rights Defenders. We have Human Rights Council Resolution 40-11 on Environmental Human Rights Defenders. But there's such an enormous gap between the words on those papers and the conditions that people are facing on the ground. And I really think that we have to focus our attention on closing that gap. And to close that gap really means changing the system. You know, as Emiliana, you were saying, we have to we have to transform this global economy that is based on the exploitation of people and nature. The only, I agree with 99.9% .9 of what you said, the only thing I would say is that it's global north, but also wealthy people wherever they live. And there are also really important communities of vulnerable and marginalized people in the global north who are living in sacrifice zones that are as horrendous as anything you would find in the global south. 
So that's the only thing that I would just add to what you said. Um, so changing the system may seem, it may sound daunting, but it really is the path forward. And I think that if we focus on two things, it actually provides us with that pathway forward. The first is states have human rights obligations to do everything we're asking them to do. These are not options. These are not possibilities. They are clearly articulated options, uh, or sorry, obligations that the work of my predecessor, John Knox, and the framework principles on human rights and the environment, the work of Michelle Forrest and his successor, Mary Lawler, have put. The, the states have clear obligations to respect, protect, and fulfill the rights of environmental human rights defenders. And one of the most important of those obligations is to control the businesses that are within their territories, jurisdictions, and control. And states are failing to fulfill those obligations catastrophically. I mean, it's just unbelievable to me. States, instead of fulfilling their human rights obligations, actually encourage, enable, and subsidize to the tune of about $1.7 trillion environmentally destructive business behavior, which is having impacts on people's human rights. So that's the first thing, is we need to hold states to their obligations. You know, with all due respect to the guiding principles on business and human rights, that's never going to make the vast majority of businesses comply with their human rights responsibilities. The only thing that makes businesses comply with their human rights responsibilities is being forced to do so through strong legislation and regulations and implementation and enforcement of that legislation and regulations. And the third thing I'll say is we also have a huge problem in every country in the world with the rule of law. That is contributing to this gap between words and actions. Corruption, inadequate resourcing of environment and human rights institutions, and a complete failure, frankly, to implement and enforce the existing climate and environmental laws, to implement and, 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 and use the existing national human rights protection mechanisms that exist in many countries but are not used. So I would really encourage us to say, you know, we don't really need a bunch more research about what the problem is. We know what the problem is. And we don't need a bunch more research about what the solutions are because we know what the solutions are. What we really need to do, focus with laser-like intensity on holding states to their obligations. And that will have cascade effects on businesses right down to the people on the ground whose rights are being violated. And I think that the recent UN recognition of the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment gives us an incredibly clear tool to use in holding states accountable because it means they have to provide people with information, with opportunities for public participation, with access to justice, all of those things without discrimination, right? We have to keep that at the heart of what we say without discrimination. And everyone has a right under the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. The clean air, safe and sufficient water, healthy and sustainably produced food, non-toxic environments where they can live, work, study, and play, healthy ecosystems and biodiversity, recognizing that humans are part of, not separate from nature. And finally, a safe and livable climate, which is probably the biggest existential threat to all of us today. So um, all we have to do, implement the right to a healthy environment, boom, <laughs> we live in a better place where everyone's rights are respected, protected, and fulfilled. Thank you. <laughs>
around the world who continue to fight for our better future despite the challenges and threats they are facing. Thank to activists who share their testimony today. The current climate crisis presents a challenge of unprecedented proportion. It is already responsible for generating and exacerbating widespread human rights violations around the world. If forcible action is not immediately taken, this will lead to even more catastrophic harm and human rights suffering in future. Undeniably, climate change will affect the future of all of us, but its impacts are disproportionately affecting marginalized communities and poor regions and countries. The strongest voices pushing back against the status quo and for more meaningful climate action have come from civil society, including indigenous people, young people, children, and other communities that have experienced the impact of the crisis. Unfortunately, instead of receiving support, climate justice advocates have been attacked and both by states and by business interests. In 2021, I presented to the UN General Assembly thematic reports in which I stressed that the exercise of the right to freedom of peaceful assembly and of association are essential to advancing climate justice. These rights provide means through which civil society and activists may come together to build a greener and more sustainable future for all. For decades, people around the world have organized in association, formal or informal, to tackle climate change and support effective and equitable measures that will guard against the dangers of global warming. Such associations have produced and analyzed scientific data, helped shape policies, foster collaboration among key stakeholders, help communities to adapt to climate change impacts, ensure that the, voice, the voices of marginalized and at-risk population are taken into account and shed light on issues affecting these populations, push back or act on many urgent action, to including organizing demonstration and peaceful protests. The, the inaction of international community and states to address the climate change crisis has triggered a new wave of global activism. The people who form this growing global climate justice movement are working to protect their natural environment and the human rights that depend on it. Unfortunately, the past years have, we have seen a consistent and worrying increase in the number of attacks and killing of environmental human rights defenders, both by states and non-state actors. The repression have taken many forms, criminalized their work, they are, they are threatened and some killed, their property attack, they, are, they suffer online harassment, as well as physical and sexual assault. They are forcibly displaced or in some cases disappear and they are excluded from decision-making on issue of vital importance to themselves, their family and communities and their livelihoods. Because of their marginalization, the work of environmental human rights defenders are often become a silent struggle. In the worst cases, they are even portrayed by media, businesses and governments as anti-development or even eco-terrorists. The repression has also taken the form of protest ban and law criminalizing legitimate acts of peaceful protest. In my previous report to UN General Assembly and in a communication that I sent to the states, I call all states and other relevant actors to respect and ensure that civil society can continue their work in the context of environmental protection. Their work benefits communities and all of us asked to advance climate justice. Urgent attention is needed at the local, national, regional, and international level to ensure that climate action and climate strategy is recognized, but also to ensure that there is a just transition 
climate crisis should not be used as an opportunity to further close the civic space. A security-based approach characterized by the stigmatization and criminalization of environmental human rights defenders and peaceful protests is not only unacceptable under the international human rights law, but also counterproductive. The urgency of climate action means more people will be in activism and protests. To address the pressing climate crisis, states should facilitate peaceful protests, not suppress them. States should re re respect, protect, and facilitate these protests and engage with organizers and participants in meaningful dialogue. Last week, I presented to the U Human Rights Council a model protocol for law enforcement to promote and protect human rights in the context of peaceful protests. The model protocol provides practical guidance to how law enforcement officials can ensure from the preparation to the facilitation of the protests that law enforcement apply the human rights approach principle and that their decision are in line with international standard. The model protocol provides, among other measures, for continuing application of de-escalation technique, including through negotiation and other strategies aimed at de-escalating any tension, any tension or violence that can raise can arise from the protests. I urge states to take in, into account the provision of the model protocol and its complementary tools to ensure that individuals and groups can exercise their fundamental freedom to peaceful protest and participate in the decision-making regarding solving the climate crisis and achieving a climate just for all. I thank you for listening to me. We will transmit to Clément Voulet all the applause <laughs> that he, he deserves. And, and indeed, this is a very important element that he has uh, presented, which is having a, a model protocol, uh, insisting also on de-escalation. These are elements which directly uh, ring to you, uh, Michel Force. Michel, you were first special rapporteur on human rights defenders. Uh, before uh, Mary Lawlor, apologies for my lapses before, <laughs> uh, and, um, and now you are the uh, Special Rapporteur on Environmental Defenders under the ORUS Convention. Now, the ORUS Convention with the ESCASO Agreement are both of the regional instruments, regional and international instruments, um, who are providing our obligations for a civic space to function correctly, on uh, access to information, public participation in decision making and access to justice. And precisely, Michel, uh, you are mandated by the parties of the ORIS Convention to make sure that uh, the practice do not uh, violate these uh, elements when people are trying to get into action. On the side of this, you have a, com a compliance committee, which is also a very, very strong uh, instrument. And But you're focusing on how people are able to use these rights in this uh, such a convention. And actually, uh, we've heard your name quite a lot over the last weeks uh, because you've hit the headlines in the UK as well as in France uh, for the very concrete action that you have done. And particularly, uh, and that rings uh, closely to what we've just heard from, uh, from Clément, uh, for disobe disobedience movement, which are attracting a lot of uh, attention, but also a lot of tensions. So, Michel, we're really very happy to have you with us. Could you tell us more about what you have done recently on, on these issues, and perhaps what are the echoes with what has been presented last week by Clem Ovoulet here at the Human Rights Council? Thank you, thank you, Eve. And uh, indeed, it was not my choice to, uh, to decide to work on civil disobedience, uh, but uh, what I've learned from my past mandate with the Rome Special Rapporteur is Never do anything. Never, uh, never propose any any uh, new uh, instrument or guidance uh, without first listening to the voice of the audience. And that's why I uh, decided to travel to countries to other uh, organize country visits to meet with uh, offshore government to see for backing for for the governments. But also, I teach every occasion, uh, trying to meet with defenders and climate activists uh, to listen to the voices uh, and uh, listen to them. I mean, at the end of the day, what they want to do with this new mandate, uh, how they see uh, the effectiveness of this new mandate, and uh, how is it complementary to two other mandates. And I've been trying quite extensively since a couple of uh, months since I've been elected in June 2022, starting in October 22, and uh, traveling to 
uh, like uh, 20 countries, uh, uh, mostly in Europe, uh, like France, Germany, Austria, Italy, Spain, Portugal, UK, many others. Uh, uh, and um, at each and every occasion, meeting with defenders. Uh, and I saw in those countries uh, uh, a great number of uh, uh, people, uh, NGOs, but also grassroots movements, uh, scientists, uh, individuals, also young people, children, defenders, uh, uh, grandmothers, uh, grandfathers, uh, taking action to defend the human rights uh, to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. Yeah. And asking government simply, government simply to take action. What have we done with the Paris commitment? Right now? Why are we not doing more? In fact, to implement the Paris Agreement. Uh, many of them, uh, especially uh, activists, uh, are using uh, um, classic forms of mobilization, like uh, demonstration, rally, social media, campaigns, advocacy. But I'm struck by the fact that uh, many of the young people children defenders uh, are using more creative forms of mobilization, like civil disobedience, uh, uh, climbing to trees uh, to prevent the cutting of trees, uh, they are blocking airports, access to roads, uh, they are dis decided to interrupt sporting events, uh, they are blocking shareholders' meetings of all multinationals, uh, using different uh, forms of mobilization to raise uh, awareness on what must be done to, to protect uh, the environment. Uh, and what, what they're facing in return is stronger uh, a common trend. They're facing a, a, a strong repression by governments, which is for me a breach of internal obligations, uh, including uh, obligations related to Article 3 of the European Convention. And that was a concerning situation for me, and that's why I thought it was important for me to also uh, discuss more in detail, uh, to uh, present a report on the situation to states, uh, uh, to clear indicate uh, to state that they are not fulfilling their obligations under uh, international human rights law. And uh, I don't have to go into details. I uh, invite you to read the report. Uh, it's a really uh, long, short report. Uh, but uh, more or less, uh, the overall assessment uh, is that we have two examples. So, first, uh, the, public, the public discourse. Uh, we see politicians, ministers, members of parliament uh, using words like eco terrorism. Uh, because he loves, like in the UK recently, uh, Greek tensions, Greek names, uh, to really fight for the defenders, uh, calling them uh, terrorist criminals, uh, and which lays the ground, in fact, uh, for new legislations and new policies to be developed in countries, uh, targeting defenders, uh, restricting uh, their modes of action, especially the right to protest, and echo precisely the what the was presenting. Public discourses and legislative policies lays also the ground for brutal and violent uh, law enforcement, leading to abuses uh, uh, because they are, they are called criminals uh, and so they would be treated as criminals in fact. Uh, and we have many examples of uh, brutality and violence by police uh, in many, many countries. Uh, uh, like in return, uh, it lays the ground also for increasing uh, persecution, which is worrying. Uh, uh, more serious charges uh, being uh, presented by that court. And at the end of the day, it's followed by courts and decisions and where we see uh, more and more preventive detention, dying conditions, and removal of defense in China, like for instance uh, in the UK, a uh, judge preventing the judge to uh, use the word climate. And if you would use the word climate, there would be contempt of court, simply for using the word. And he decided to do so, it was sentenced twice. Uh, and also, our sentences are more than sentences, like prison in the 27 months prison in the UK for blocking access to, uh, to a road. And for me, what's happening is great, it's worth It has a, diff a, a direct effect, a chilling effect, it prevents defenders' voices to be heard. No protest, and no mention of climate change in court, because it's for me uh, clearly indication of those states want to uh, proceed. It also an indirect effect, a chilling effect on the overall society, where people are concerned by those issues, but they fear to protest, fear to go to the street, fear to demonstrate, but fear to protest. And it's a clear breach again of Article 3.8 and the right to protest, but on, not only uh, Article 3.8 of the Article Convention. That's a backlash, the lack of understanding of what should be done in law enforcement uh, Article 7. And uh, for me, uh, when laws are unjust uh, and not in the joint interest, uh, for me, that's clear, it's just to avoid those laws. And what I see is that uh, states do not respect the principle of proportionality. And all I'm telling in this report to governments, uh, do not use theaters 
on whole protester is just one person. Do not prosecute for and then the life of others for roadblocks and when traffic obstructions to be used. Or for sedition for simply calling the public to participate in protest. Or do not imprison for six months of the festival to march slowly simply to protest on the, uh, the national government. So what in for me was happening in Europe uh, while at the same time uh, Europe is teaching other countries uh, how to put a protective and develop a mechanism in Colombia and also in Africa to put a protective system. There's a lack of coherence in Europe where you see that there are putting efforts and money and policies to develop to protect defenders outside of Europe, while inside of Europe they are not able to protect their defenders. Not only are they not able to protect them, but they are targeting them, putting them in jail. That's one of the major outcome of this. And uh, the report is not only uh, it's, it's only it's only the first part of my my uh, my uh, decision. It will be uh, it's a position paper of one data, and it will be followed by other. Uh, reports and uh, why I intend to, do, to develop is the guidelines. Uh, guidelines are uh, two sheets uh, to guide states on, on how the state would uh, uh, decide to to, uh, to take uh, more seriously uh, civil disobedience as a mean of action. And I would like to invite you, all of you, uh, to cooperate to, to contribute to this report. I will send to you uh, shortly uh, an invitation to provide guidance. Uh, lastly, because I see time is short, a few words. As I said, consultation is important for me because we need to hear the voice of those who are affected by, uh, by climate change and, and the pollution and, and the loss of the biodiversity. And uh, I've done the first series of consultations uh, in the north of the countries, inviting uh, some means uh, from uh, Finland, Norway, uh, Sweden to meet with me, also Inuits from Finland to talk to me to explain the situation and how they would see the mandate. Recently, last week, I was in, uh, in Almaty uh, meeting with defenders from Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, and Kyrgyzstan to listen to their voices. Uh, and what I hear from them is really a matter of concern. I need to speak to states. Uh, and later on, we'll do, uh, before the end of the year, consultations in Croatia, inviting defenders from Europe to meet with me, consultation in Serbia to meet with defense from the Balkans, Bal 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 and then, and then uh, consultations in Africa. In Latin America, we know that uh, countries that, that the companies that are based in one of the countries, which is part of the US Convention, are the most dangerous uh, to defenders in those countries. And I want to invite defenders from those regions also meet with me to see whether or not my mother also to defend. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Michel. This was quite, uh, quite an impressive. Uh, content that you you have just uh, just shared um, unfortunately I mean we had hoped to to be able to have a, a one hour and a half session uh, the fight for rooms in the UN building as all of those who are working here know it's a very fierce one so we are just allowed still uh, a few minutes um, after one but we won't be able to have a full session as we have hoped and so uh, unfortunately I will have to skip the uh, questions and and, and comments. Um, but please, for those uh, who are online, at least they will have them this advantage. Don't hesitate to put it in the chat. We'll take them and we'll copy them and then we'll try to share them with those to who they, it could be addressed. So please do so, so that we do have a few uh, exchanges. Um, I don't know if any of the panelists wanted to raise uh, questions to the uh, special procedures. If it's not the case, uh, I really want to thank uh, the special procedures for what they have shared with us. Um, I think it's quite an interesting element. We have seen and we have felt also the challenges that we have for environmental defenders. Uh, I was talking just last week to one of the major actors in the field of human rights defenders in general. And the person was saying that actually they're starting to realize that about 70% of the cases they're working on have a, a, a relation to environmental issues. So there's something, unfortunately, going in the very wrong direction today, and uh, we have to take uh, this very, very uh, seriously. That said, we have heard a number of elements which are going the other directions with what has uh, the proposals which coming from the courts in Colombia needs to be taken very seriously. Uh, they are very good elements to, to follow. Uh, we've heard also, uh, we know the reports of the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment, uh, we've heard also uh, what Michel Force is proposing and uh, Clément Voulet. So we have here material to work with and to fight with. And I think this is really very, very important. 
And it's not just to uh, have the state in, uh, accountable, it's also to reverse the tide. There is a change that needs to be done, and, and we hope that the Human Rights Council will be one of the places, because that's what it's done for. So we hope that it's going to be one of the places, as well as UNEA, UNEP, and others, will be the places where we can change uh, this very, very worrying trend and very worrying wind. Having said that, I'd like to turn now to the two closing remarks. Uh, we are going, we'll start with uh, Peter Larson from the um, uh, Geneva Roadmap 4011. And I'll give the floor afterwards to the International Service for Human Rights. Peter, for a few words, thank, thank not you. more than three yeah, minutes. <laughs> thank you so much, Yves, and indeed thank you to all the panelists. I think you really laid out the ground. I wanted to start with you, Ms. Rickenmantel-Montes. Your comment about we talk more about the death sometimes than about the work. And indeed, I think one of the things that, that we really need to talk more about is that everyday work of environmental actors. Uh, ranging from the individuals to the organizations, the communities, the conditions under which we do the work. Uh, indeed, right now, seeing systemic challenges, as Ms. Valencia, you insisted upon, and, and the conditions in Colombia. We have systemic challenges really affecting these conditions of work, and we need systemic change, as you said, David, right? But at the same time, what I find and what we see is that all these decisions, there are a number of everyday decisions that are affecting the working conditions of environmental defenders that are taking place every day. In terms of um, shrinking spaces for civic space, the rules determining what environmental organizations can do. So it's true that in, in our work and our research at the university, we see organizations facing these changes in real everyday decisions being taken at local, regional, and even global levels. And, and that, that's really where I think that, yes, we need system change, but we also need to acknowledge that everyday level. As, as you were saying, Michelle, there are so many situations now where, uh, where people are fearful of uh, fear, fear in so many ways, and fundamentally also now increasingly afraid of doing their work. And, it, and this goes not only for frontline defenders, it goes for, for, for government officials responsible for these domains not able to speak up. It goes for my own scientific community, environmental scientists uh, being silenced, etc. So I think, I think we really, yes, we need systems change, but we also need to acknowledge that sort of whole everyday sorts of decisions that we are we were affecting and where we can all make a difference. And yes, we need to make states accountable, but also the I think the all the other environmental actors, the big NGOs and so on working in this field that fundamentally are able to speak in a certain way, but critical voices are sort of left outside of the, the decisions. So in that sense, how we can open up our meeting spaces, how we can open up our policy processes and avoid situations like you described, the uh, where basically two two young people researching on an environmental issue are are ending are ending up being stigmatized and not even able actually to speak up on these topics. So thank you so much for everyone. I really thought this was extremely powerful messages. Thank you, Peter. And now for the final word of conclusion, Tess, uh, as one of the co-organizer, the International Human Rights, uh, the International <laughs> Service for Human Rights, uh, is also one of the co-organizer of the event. So Tess, the floor is yours. Thank you. I will try to be correct. Um, firstly, I just wanted to say thank you to all the panelists today, and that I feel very privileged to speak to some of these speakers, especially Emiliana and Priyatia, and, and your experts. Um, in closing, I've been asked to very briefly introduce a project that my organization and 16 other organizations have been working on for the past year that we're calling the Declaration Plus 25. It's looking at where we are now 20 years after the adoption of the UN Declaration on Human Rights Defenders. It's a project that seems to be guided by civil society, guided by experts, and guided by youth as well. Um, we've been consulting with defenders since the last year. In fact, we just came from a consultation right before this with queer and LGBT defenders who are in the room right now. And um, the outcome of this project will be a civil society led document that will be endorsed by experts that considers how international and regional jurisprudence in relation to defenders has developed over the last 25 years. It will look at changes in national, regional, and political contexts, evolutions in human rights movements and activism, addressing gaps and limitations in the Declaration, and reflecting lived experiences and needs of defenders. Elements that have arisen to date in consultation, many of which came up today in the conversations, including positive decisions by courts, such as that discussed by Anne Maria in, in Colombia, and development of binding obligations, such as the Ask Peace Convention and the SCASU Agreement intersectionality, elements on civil disobedience and assemblies that have come and been shared by Michelle Force and Mokule, 
recognition and protection of tribunal rights, especially of indigenous communities, and discussions on acoustic protection, and elements around rights connected to the environment, and that violations of the right of the environment and there may amount to a violation of the right there. So we're hoping that in developing this project, we can assist to strengthen normative standards to also strengthen their implementation and assist holding states accountable, as David Boyd is really focused on this intervention. So to close, I'd like to sincerely thank all the panelists again. We're in the midst of a triple planetary crisis with climate change, loss of biodiversity and pollution. And in this context, the work of environmental defenders is essential. However, they continue to be some of the most targeted. So as we continue to ensure accountability for violations against environmental defenders and we focus on foreign on states and their obligations, we need to listen to environmental defenders, we need to listen to residents, we need to listen to communities, we need to protect them and we need to protect the environment. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Tess. And I'll give now uh, and back <laughs> the uh, uh, the moderation to uh, Diana for the very uh, final word. Just to thank you, Eve, and uh, all the co organizers, and to um, also warmly thank uh, David, Professor David Boyd for the last session of the UNMS Council. This is the last talk at this session of the Council, but uh, we hope to have such talks on the successor uh, next year. So, um, for those who were late, as I mentioned at the beginning, or I don't know if they mentioned that. The summary and, and, and the video of the report of this uh, event will be available on the webpage of the event. So, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We do have one more event tomorrow on two markets. So, we have more. No. There are a few more events that are, I mean, the talks are over, but there are many, indeed, I should not mention that. There are many more events. There is the environmental law flow, the, the, the launch of the report, and there are a few other events. There is also a side event to the regional forum on, on, uh, on human rights, where we will also be uh, discussing uh, this uh, report. And yourself, David, will be uh, uh, speaking on panels of other events. And I don't know your program, Michel, but you might also. So there is much more which is available on the page that we have uh, uh, that we keep promoting on the environmental activities at the session of the Human Rights Council that might appear on this uh, screen or not. No, we've got to understand here. But I will add there are many other things. I will add in the line of what David has just said that there will be also two other events on the 15th and on the 21 about uh, the situation of uh, defenders in Azerbaijan, the country that will greet. COP29. Uh, there are a lot of concerns, uh, and we hope that it will be possible for all of the climate and environmental defenders to be able to participate. There's a huge challenge there, and we'll have twice the opportunity to talk about that with the uh, um, Human Rights House Foundation and the Institute for Human Rights on the 15th and the uh, 21st. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.